All right, so I'm unfortunately not going to be quite as exuberant and going out into space. Um, I'm talking about motivating undergraduate communication theory using new radio. And um, just short, uh, briefly, what is the question uh, that we're trying to address? We have noticed over the past couple of years a signi significant drop in the number of students who are actually taking communications classes, especially at the undergraduate level mainly because they're afraid of the mathematics. If they look at the textbooks, they will find that they have to go through some two, 300 pages of textbook first before they ever see anything that uh, re remotely resembles the kind of communication devices that they use daily, uh, their telephones and so forth. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, upfront show them that communications actually can be done, that they can do it, that you can play with it, that you can have some intuition about it, and, and um, get a first immersion into it, and then start looking at the medics on an as-needed basis. And we're using new radio for that. Okay, so um, I've structured it as a basic communication system in four acts. Uh, we're only gonna be able to cover two acts here. Uh, the rest I will cover on Thursday when uh, there is the continuation of this talk. And what we are trying to do is just a, a very simple idea of taking a digital text and transmit that over a channel, over a simulated channel in this particular case, and then receive it at the other end and actually see that the text is coming back. So we don't want to just have random data going in and uh, then some data coming out and comparing th those two things. That's not really motivating for somebody who is starting out with communications. We want to see an actual text and we want to see what impairments of the communication does to that text. So the first thing is we have to do a parallel to serial conversion of the text so that we get out of uh, ASCII bytes, we get uh, individual bits or pairs of bits. Then we have to do a discrete time to continuous time uh, conversion uh, of a BT sequence to a CT waveform. Uh, then what I'm not gonna talk about today but what you need to keep in mind is uh, we're gonna add noise next to the communication channel to see what that does. And then uh, we, don't, we do a maximization of the signal to noise ratio at the receiver by actually using mathematics to show what is the best that we can do to maximize this uh, signal to noise ratio. So the idea is not to skip the mathematics, the idea is just to interleave it better with the experience so that you get to see what you can do with it and then you realize, oh, maybe I should ask some questions and I should sit down and actually solve some formulas so that I get better performance for my communication system. So most of you probably have heard or seen the ASCII code. It's a, a way of taking alphabetic characters and making them into uh, eight bits. And we wanna take those individual bits basically and transmit those. So we need to do a parallel to serial conversion. So that's the first thing that we do. The students at this point uh, know practically nothing about GNU radio and about how the system works. We give, it, we give them a GNU radio on a memory stick so that they can run it. It's a memory stick that has Linux on it as well as the GNU radio software. And then we go through it step by step. What can you do? So we make a vector source. Inside that vector source, we, we put the vector that's done in Python. The students learn Python actually at the same time also as they are doing this. So we, uh, I chose the text zombie at this point in time to transmit. Then we do pack to unpack. That's a regular GNU radio block uh, where we do the conversion from the bytes to the bits. Then uh, because we are just simulating this in software, we need to have something that holds back or, 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 or sets the rate of how we transmit. If you just use the software, it's just gonna go wild and transmits at any rate. So we have the throttle block in here that keeps it at the rate that we want to have. The uh, FB here is the baud rate and we are setting this at 32 uh, kilo samples per second or kilobaud per second. And then we want to see at the output what we're actually created so we use a QT GUI uh, time sync that's basically an oscilloscope. And this only can accept uh, either real numbers or complex numbers at the input, floating point numbers essentially. And since we are putting out uh, bits here, we have to do a conversion from those bits to the real numbers so that we can actually see that. Okay, now uh, a couple little details for those of you who haven't worked with the GNU radio yet. Um, 
there's different data types. You have seen in the picture before that um, there, there are places where we have those purple kind of inputs and outputs and those places where we have orange kind of input outputs. That, signif uh, that tells you basically what the data type is. And um, this list you, you can actually find uh, in, the, in the menu of, or in the help of the uh, new radio companion. If you mismatch those data types, then you're going to get red arrows, and that means that the flow graph is not going to work. So you have to pay attention to that and do uh, con conversion if necessary. So now we can execute that first simple flow graph and see what it does, and we get to see at the output um, zeros and ones, so it, we just converted it to binary. There is a little thing here. This is a tag. That's a very handy thing that you can do in the um, original flow graph here. The tag is actually made here, and then it's inserted in the vector source. The vector source is producing the tags periodically, so it repeats it over and over again, and the tag is then sent along with, the, with that text uh, on, on the first uh, text you can choose the offset. The offset is chosen to be zero here. So it's um, marking basically where the beginning of the text is. So when you then look at it um, in the oscilloscope, you can actually synchronize to that and you can see where the text starts. And then you can take the following bits and check, does that really encode the text that I have been making? Uh, in order to get those nice kind of displays, you have to fiddle a little bit. You have to use the middle mouse button to change the plot properties and to make it into a stem plot. By uh, default, it's just making a line plot, and it's sometimes hard to see discrete data if you just look at the line plot. OK, then uh, once we understand what we are doing with the parallel to serial conversion, then we want to make that into a block that is, first of all, more general. So we have parameters up here, like how many bits per symbol, um, the endianness, that means LSB first or, or MSB first, uh, uh, polar or unipolar and so forth. So there's a number of things that you uh, would want to change when you do parallel to, to serial conversion. And you don't, every time when you need such a, a source, you, you don't want to uh, put all the blocks in there every time. Once you understand what's going on, you want to collapse it into one block that you can put in there. And GNU Radio uh, Companion has a nice feature where you can actually make hierarchical blocks and this is one of those blocks. So you choose in the, in, in the top uh, block here, you choose that this is a hierarchical block. So that's a block that you will create, uh, compile, and then you can pull that in as just a regular block, but it's your own block which you have created according to your needs. Okay, and so it has here, uh, it has an input, uh, it has an output, and then uh, it has a bunch of things here. That th those two things together, they make it so that you can choose whether it's polar or unipolar. Then there is the parallel to serial conversion. You can uh, change here. Actually, this is the polar to unipolar selection. Th this is something else. This is to invert the bits, the, the ones complement, and so on. But the main point is you, you put in features in there that you might want to use and that you then have available as uh, parameters. So if I make this now, into a regular block, you, you compile it, and then you have to basically get out of the GNU Radio Companion and go back in again, and then it's available as a regular block. You can actually see down here where it is available, I believe. Yeah, ask it to float symbols is, is the, the thing that I did here. Uh, and so now I have this block here. That's the block that I created myself with my um, specifications. The vector source is still the same as before. I still need the throttle block and I have the, the oscilloscope to display the results at the end. Okay, and so here, I just for variation, I chose to, to uh, look at uh, two bits at a time, so my symbols are now four valued symbols, and each of those has two bits. So we have, for polar, we have negative and positive uh, numbers, minus three, minus one, one, and three. So we transmit for each of those discrete time symbols, we transmit two bits. If it's unipolar, then we only have positive values, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And we can choose that on the fly by using um, the radio buttons here uh, that uh, are programmed uh, or, or that are specified here in the QT GUI chooser. You 
uh, can now go in and you can demonstrate what's the difference between polar and unipolar and you can talk about uh, the fact that this is closer to being DC free whereas this one certainly is going to have a DC component and that may not be good if you have transformers in, along your transmission line or something like that. Okay, and so at this point we have an end-to-end -end discrete time communication system where we have our vector source with the text, we have the ASCII to float symbol conversion and then at the receiving end we do the float symbol to ASCII conversion, so that's another one of those hierarchical blocks that just undoes what um, this one here is doing and then we can go here in a file sync and the file sync for that one I chose a, a TTY, a teletype terminal in Linux so that I can actually see the text. I don't have a live version of this particular one, I will have one a little bit later if that um, is going to work here. But that's basically what you get to see now. You see what the transmitted discrete time signal is, you see what the decoded text is, and then you have here a slider where you can choose the symbol delay. When you have this um, conversion from bytes, from ASCII bytes to bits, and then back from bits to bytes again, there is the issue to align those bits with the ASCII bytes. Okay? You cannot just arbitrarily start with one bit and expect that you see ASCII code out of that. You have to align it so that you're in synchronism with the 8-bit structure of the ASCII code. And so if, you do, if, you, if you're sliding this, then you get to see that the text here gets garbled up and you don't really understand anything anymore. Okay, now the next step is to actually um, make continuous time signals. Uh, all, pre pre pretty much all practical channels, they are analog in nature and not dis digital, certainly not discrete time. And so we are making pulse amplitude modulation. This is the formula for that. So here we start getting into the mathematics of it. Uh, different pulse shapes uh, like rectangular pulse, triangular pulse, uh, sine x over x type pulse. Those pulses, of course, are going to have different uh, spectra and this one's going to use most of the bandwidth, this one's going to use the least amount of bandwidth. And so we now make a pulse amplitude modulation here by using an interpolating FIR filter, finite impulse response filter. Basically, we are still operating in the dis discrete time system, but we're just choosing a much higher data rate or sampling rate when we simulate the continuous time part. So in here we come with this discrete time. Here we interpolate and make um, more uh, bits. Uh, typically we use about uh, an interpolation factor of 10 and then out here comes the continuous time signal. Okay, the, the actual shape of the pulse is done in Python. So this is the program that um, uh, makes that and that's then being plugged into the filter coefficients of that FIR filter that I just showed. So now here is the signal where we have ASCII code at the input, then we convert it to, to, to symbols, then we have the pulse amplitude modulation transmitter, so here we have now continuous time uh, signals in, in quotes, continuous time as much as you can do it with a higher sampling rate, and then comes the question how do we now get our text back? And the simplest thing is to just take one sample per symbol and just look at that. And that works fine as long as you don't have noise. Uh, so here is, a, is, is what that looks like for a rectangular pulse. The rectangular pulse is the simplest intuitively to use. So we just simply extend, if we have a one, we just extend that for the duration of a, of a symbol. And if you have a minus one, we extend that as well. And then the red uh, dots in here, that, that shows the times when we sample that at the receiver to take a look at what did we receive. So as long as there is no noise, it doesn't really matter how we shift that back and forth within a symbol interval. If there is noise, of course, things are getting garbled up and, um, uh, and, and that would, would then be what we're doing in Act 3 and Act 4 to add noise to it and see what does that do if we just do this technique and then uh, comes the idea uh, as a next thing that maybe we should filter that in some way so that we are not dependent on just a single sample when we are receiving things but on many of them so that not all of them are hopefully going to be affected by um, the, the excessive um, noise that can happen. So uh, um, the last slide here I think is the live version of this if it works. Uh, let's see, I'll click on here, I put this on uh, YouTube, and I guess it doesn't really 
do anything. It might be the PDF version that I have here. Okay, so um, I, I'll just tell you in, in a few words what, what, what's happening here. Uh, and you can actually look that up on, on Google uh, or on YouTube as well. It's, it's, uh, if you just uh, choose uh, Mattis and Noiseless Pam, you will probably find this thing here. Um, so what it does is it shows uh, what happens when I use those um, radio buttons here. So I can use uh, a rectangular pulse, triangular pulse, uh, RCF, the stands for race cosine and frequency that's similar to, to the sync pulse. That's the one that uses the least amount of bandwidth. And then you get to see the picture, how it changes here, and you get to see here how the spectrum is shaping up, how it becomes more narrow or wider. And then Act 3 and Act 4, which, which I'm going to talk about on Thursday, um, then shows um, what's happening if you put noise in, what's happening if you put the matched filter to mitigate the noise as much as you can and maximize the signal-to-noise ratio. And then later things are being placed on a carrier, and then you can actually send it out wirelessly uh, with all the um, problems that come along with a wireless transmission, like having to synchronize uh, the transmitter and receiver and so forth. So there's a whole sequence of things, and the nice thing about it is that you get to see, you, you get to see some success at every stage that you're working, and you also get to see there's a necessity to learn some more things and to delve into some mathematics and actually then um, improve your system this way. So that's what I've prepared for this talk uh, to keep it down to the 20 minutes, hopefully. All right, let's thank Dr. Peter Mathis. And we do have time for a question or two while we get geared up for the next talk. Is there anyone in the audience who has a question? We have one here. Uh, Michael? I didn't see on the flow graph. How did you implement the uh, radio buttons that let you switch out which pulse shape you oh, used? Um, yeah, that, that was uh, done by choosing in, in the Python code, which generates the, the filter tabs for the interpolating filter. So inside there, it chooses uh, different parameters for that. So that's part of the Python program which I wrote or which the students are writing. It's not part of new radio. You have to write that yourself. But if you look at the proceedings, uh, I've been putting in the Python code for most of it. Not for all of it, but most of it. Are your classes available online? Um, uh, by and large, yes. Uh, the, I have a, a website that's public for it. Um, and. Uh, but I have not uh, put everything on there. You know, I'm, I'm talking, uh, I'm using the whiteboard, I'm using uh, new radio and so on. It, it's not all on there, but there is a summary of most of the things that I do. All right, let's thank Dr. Peter Mathis once again. Thank you. And uh, just to reiterate, uh, so uh, using Gunner Radio in education at both the undergraduate and graduate level, um, and even beyond that, training instructors and, and professors uh, is a really big push for us right now. Uh, in addition to Dr. Uh, Mathis, uh, Dr. Eve Klopp is here, and I believe she has a poster. Uh, and Martin Walsh will be talking about it. And uh, Dr. Mathis has a 30-minute presentation on Thursday, right? Yeah, to continue this. Uh, so if you have any questions, please talk to him, uh, Dr. Klopp or Martin.